welcome back to part three. Let's look at our learning objectives for 18.2, documenting immunizations and assisting in the pediatric examination. I'm going to summarize the immunization recommended for children by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, demonstrate how to document immunizations and maintain accurate immunization records, compare a well child examination with a sick child examination, outline the medical assistance rule in pediatric procedures, measure the circumference of an infant's head, obtain accurate length and weight measurement and plot pediatric growth patterns, accurately measure pediatric vital signs and perform vision screening, and correctly apply a pediatric urine collection device as well as describe the characteristics and needs of the adolescent patient, specify child safety guidelines for injury prevention and explain the management of suspected child abuse, neglect, or exploitation, summarize patient education guidelines for pediatric patients, and discuss the legal and ethical implications in pediatric practice. So the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, recommends immunizations against infectious disease for all children. Vacu or, I'm sorry, vaccines consist of attenuated organisms or their toxins, which result in the body producing antibodies against specific pathogens. All are tested for safety and effectiveness, but side effects may occur. Booster doses usually are equivalent to a single dose of the initial immunization. For some immunizations, such as tetanus, boosters are prescribed at designated intervals to ensure maintenance of immune levels. We must provide a copy of a vaccine information sheet, a VIS, to either adult patient or child parent or legal guardian. So every time that we are going to administer immunizations, it's very important to bring in the VIS form and make sure that the parent understands what's encompassed in there and feels comfortable. The medical assistant must know the potential allergic problems, common symptoms, and adverse reactions to these immunizations and must make sure that the parent is informed. In figure 18.7, it shows the recommended immunization schedules for children ages birth to 18 years. I want you to take a close look at this, as well as 18.2, which shows the guidelines for childhood immunizations. So procedures for providing the VIS before the vaccine. You want to give the patient the most current VIS available for that particular vaccine. Document in the child's medical record the date that the VIS form was given and the publication date of that form. Make sure the office has the most current forms. You can actually refer to the website for this and it, they keep them updated and it's very easy to use. Uh, make sure that an informed consent form is signed before giving each immunization. An official immunization booklet should be given to the parent and updated as needed. We also now in many of our um, care facilities have electronic records and these can be used as well. Vaccine vials should be handled and stored properly to maintain the ability to fight the disease. You want to make sure that you give the patient enough time or the parent enough time to review the information and answer any questions or refer the parent's concerns to the physician before administering the vaccine. The medical assistant should not only document the required details on the patient's medical record, but also complete the parent's immunization booklet each time the child receives another vaccine or booster. Again, sometimes these are now done electronically and then we print them out and give them to the parent. But if they have their record, the little yellow record in the case of California, um, you do fill those out. Procedure 18.1 outlines the procedures for documenting immunizations, and we will definitely be doing this in class. So this is the pediatric patient APGAR score, and you can find this 
In Table 18.3 in your book, the APGAR score is a system for evaluating the infant's physical condition at a one and five minute interval after birth. This scoring system evaluates the following. It, it evaluates appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. Let's talk about well child visits. Frequency of well child visits vary with the physician and the community. Visits focus on maintaining the child's health through basic system examinations, immunizations, and upgrading, I'm sorry, up, yes, upgrading a child's medical history record, I would say updating. And medical history is an essential guide to the pediatric examination. It's important to note that often the child looks to the parent for approval before answering or performing a skill. For this reason, the physician may want to assess the child alone. Lead paint exposure. So high blood lead levels can result in serious brain injury, including seizures, coma, and death, and lower levels can cause learning problems, stunted growth, and behavior disorders. So lead-based paint in the homes and on imported toys and chronic exposure to lead contaminated dust are the most common causes of this. And the CDC recommends a screening blood lead test for all children between one and two years of age. Let's look at the sick child visit. So the medical assistant should follow established office policies, but when in doubt about the seriousness of a problem, he or she should ask the office manager or physician for advice. The medical assistant will frequently be the first point of contact for a sick child and the caregiver. It's important to determine whether the child should be seen immediately or if a problem can wait for an opening in the schedule. If the child is younger than two years of age and the parent reports frequent crying, lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, and or fever of 103 or higher, it's important to have the child seen right away. Table 18.4 summarizes some important questions for telephone screening of an older child who can communicate his or her own symptoms. It's important to remember, as with any other patient, that all telephone communication should be documented to record the reason for the call, the information gathered, the action taken, including whether the physician was consulted, any orders given, and whether and when an appointment was scheduled. And we are not in California allowed to technically triage. So the way this is done is there are certain uh, protocols that you can follow and it's very specific but if it goes beyond the protocol then the physician or a registered nurse uh, can get involved as far as whether to decide. I know in our pediatric office at Sutter for any of those types of calls we actually had a specific registered nurse that would take the calls do the triage and make those decisions because it is out of our scope of practice to actually triage and make the decisions without um, getting input from physician or the registered nurse so your role as a medical assistant in pediatric procedures you are to assist the pediatrician with examinations, upgrade or update patient histories, perform order screening tests, administer immunizations, measure and weigh children as needed, and provide patient and caregiver support. It's very important when we talk again about measuring the weight and height. How do we do medications many times? correct based on weight. So we need to make sure that all of our vitals are accurate. Make sure to develop a relationship with the pediatric patient that encourages cooperation and compliance. 
Use a firm and direct approach about expected behavior and offer sincere praise. Explain each step in a simple term and offer choices if possible. It's really important that the child understand and that you don't just take over or restrain the child. If you offer reasonable choices when possible, let me give you an example. Would you like your shot in your left or your right leg? You wouldn't say, are you ready for your shot now? Because if you ask that, you know most of the time the child is going to say no, right? So you want to make sure that your, your choices are reasonable because you can't go back on that if they say no and say, okay, you don't have to get it. Whatever the child's age, the medical assistant should be sensitive to his or her individual needs and should adapt the examination and procedure as much as possible to meet those needs. The pediatrician probably will leave the procedures and tests that are likely to cause the most objections until the end of the appointment so that they can get through and really assess the child. Measurement. So the size of the head reflects the growth of the brain. Brain growth is 50% complete by the first year of age, 75% complete by age three, and 90% by age six. If the circumference of the head deviates greatly from normal measurements, hydrocephaly and microcephaly may be suspected. If you look at procedure 18-2, this outlines the procedure for measuring the circumference of an infant's head, and we will be doing this in class and lab. Medical assistants also need to record the height or length and weight. Growth charts consist of a series of percentile curves that illustrate the distribution of selected body measurements. BMI growth charts can be used beginning at the age of two. And you'll see in your resource videos that you have how to read a growth chart and that will help as to understand the specifics. If you look at procedure 18.3, we're going to outline the procedure for measuring an infant's length and weight and we will be doing this in class. Assisting with the examination. So vital signs are measured first. Blood pressure measurements are not included in most pediatric examinations. However, after the age of three in our office, we did do blood pressures. So up to the age of three, we did not. After the age of three, it was included. So it'll depend on office policies. You want to stand at the head of the table and support the young child's head between your hands during physician's examinations. And be patient. Explain the procedures and respect the privacy. If you can only imagine how, if we're scared as adults, it's a whole new world for these little guys and you wanna make sure that you make them feel supported and safe. What methods are used for taking a child's temperature? Well, I think you know this because we've been working on vitals for quite a while now, but depending on the child's age and level of cooperation, the temperature may be obtained by the axillary, oral, rectal, tympanic, or temporal method. How about the pulse? How do you think we get a pulse in the child? If the child is younger than age two, the pulse is measure, measured apically by placing the stethoscope on the left side of the chest, medial to the nipple, and always count the beats for one full minute for accuracy. We have done this procedure in class and we'll continue to work on it in lab. An alternative method for obtaining the pulse of a very young child is to use the brachial artery in the upper arm. And after age two, the child's pulse may be taken at the radial pulse site. Procedure 18-4 describes how to perform the pediatric vital signs and the vision screening, and we will be doing this in lab and in class. Obtaining a urine sample. So samples can be obtained at home by a parent if the child is toilet trained. Pediatric urine collection devices for younger children 
uh, you can secure and re-diaper, and it fits depending off if it's a male or female child. The um, bag fits a little bit differently over the opening of the vagina area or over the penile area. Occasionally, catheterization may be necessary.